Dear colleagues, good evening. My name is Dr. Tufan Tarjan, and I would like to welcome you all to our webinar on vesicovaginal fistula. I would like to first thank the European School of Urology for organizing this very important webinar on this very important subject. And uh, also, I would like uh, to introduce my uh, two colleagues who will be in this webinar. It's my real privilege to be with them. Uh, there are uh, two important experts in the field of uh, vesicovaginal fistula, Professor Veronique Fay from Paris and Professor George Cassian from uh, Moscow. So, if I may, I would like to start the first presentation by sharing my screen. Yeah. So... These are my disclosures, actually. None of them are related to our topic today. And we have planned uh, with Professor Fay and Cassian together the webinar as follows. Uh, I will start with an uh, overlook to the subject and then Professor Fay will briefly speak about clinical diagnosis and classification. And Professor Cassian will present um, his uh, video presentation and we will uh, follow this with a discussion. Questions can be asked through the question portal anytime uh, throughout this webinar. And I also would like to mention that this webinar is accredited with one European CME credit uh, upon completion of the questionnaire after attending this webinar. So please do not forget uh, to answer uh, those questions. So we all know that the vesicovaginal fistula is the most common form of urinary tract fistula, and it is known since ancient times. It was recorded in ancient Egypt since 1550 BC. Avicenna, as also known with his original name, Ibn Sina, documented the relationship between vesicovaginal fistula and obstructed uh, labor uh, in uh, 1037 AD. And the first surgical repair uh, was performed by Hendrik von Ronhuse in 1663. He denuded the fistula margins and then approximated them with sharpened uh, stiff swan quills. But John Fatio is generally credited uh, with the first successful vesicovaginal repair that was done in 1675. He actually used uh, the same technique of von uh, Ronhuse. So we have to uh, mention some uh, other important milestone names uh, in the progress of uh, the surgical treatment. For example, John Peter Metawa was first to close the fistula in the United States. Then James Marion Sims, he operated uh, on three girls without anesthesia under opium, and he used silver wire uh, in a transvaginal approach, and he achieved success at his third ETA in one patient. Of course, his practice was open some um, ethical criticism. Uh, Friedrich Trendelenburg pioneered the uh, first transphysical approach in 1890, and Alvin McEnroth was the first who performed the layered repair in 1894. And Heinrich Martius proposed the famous Martius flap in 1928. When we come today, However, we still see that the vesicovaginal fistula is a challenging urological problem. And we look to the etiology and we see two main reasons for vesicovaginal fistula uh, as of today. The first one being reatrogenic and modern causes, for example, gynecologic surgery, pelvic radiation, forgotten vaginal foreign bodies or uninhibited cancer growth are reasons for iatrogenic or also so-called modern causes of vesicovaginal fistula. Uh, in more than 75% of cases in Europe or in North America are attributed to iatrogenic cases. However, uh, in some parts of the world, uh, some regions of Africa, Asia, and South America, the most common etiology is related to obstetrics. And here, the poor perinatal care and the lack of timely cesarean sections play the uh, most important role. And unfortunately, this leads to a very big social problem um, for a female population, uh, leading to uh, even suicides, or uh, if not, uh, certainly isolation of uh, women from the 
society, divorces, etc. So vesicovaginal fistula is not only a medical problem, but also a social problem uh, in uh, some parts of the world. Incidence ranges, uh, talking about obstetric fistula, in one to four cases per 1,000 deliveries, and prevalence ranges from uh, zero to 81 cases per 1,000 women. Um, and the obstetric fistula uh, still continues to be a big problem. Before we proceed with the management, I think we have to also talk how should we prevent uh, the fistula from occurring. And talking about obstetric fistula, I think prevention of early marriages and malnutrition uh, are certainly mandatory to decrease the numbers. And of course, together with a better obstetric care. Talking about the atherogenic reasons, a better surgical training, a better patient care certainly decreases the number of our patients. There is another issue, which is the medical legal aspects. These patients are prone to medical legal issues for many reasons, as we know, and they are under big physical and psychological distress, uh, and they need to be honestly and thoroughly managed. The management uh, is usually surgery. However, we know that in rare cases, especially in small size fistulas and in early periods, conservative management is also possible. There are plenty of surgical techniques and modifications, and there are modifications that need to be altered on a case-by-case -case basis. So there is no one surgical technique that we can apply or that should be applied on every case and which uh, works uh, the best. So the surgeon should be familiar with a variety of approaches and techniques. And I hope that this webinar uh, will uh, help us in uh, understanding uh, these modifications and some may be challenging points uh, better. So it's my uh, great privilege now to pass the microphone to my colleague, uh, dear colleague, Professor Veronique Fay, who will talk about the clinical diagnosis and classification. Veronique, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Tefan. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you are doing well. So here is my shared screen. Okay, so during the next five minutes, we are going to talk about classification. You know that the hallmark sign of vesicle vaginal fistula is leakage of urine, which can be intermittent or constant, but painless. And you know that the diagnosis of a vesicle vaginal fistula usually requires a clinical assessment, very precise, and often a combination with appropriate imaging. So you need to make a direct visual inspection, to do a cystoscopy, and the retrograde bladder filling with the colored fluid is really essential. You can place also a tampon into the vagina in order to identify staining and to make the diagnosis. Sometimes, contrast enhanced CT scan with a late excretory phase and a magnetic resonance imaging in particular with T2 sequences can be interesting if you look for other structures involved or if you've got difficulties to do the diagnosis. This is the recommendation of the EAU guidelines and the EAU guidelines recommend to use the classifications when you deal with fistula. So which classification are you going to use? The wild yeast and ghost classifications were widely used for the diagnosis and the follow-up, but they were originally designed for obstetric fistula and the use in diatrogenic fistula is less relevant. In the left side of the screen, you can see the Wojcik classification, which is based on the size and the site of the fistula. So type one fistula is when you are very far from the external urethral orifice. The type two uh, of the classification is for fistula, which is close to the external urethral orifice. And it depends on if the urethra is involved or not and if the defect is circumferential or not. And the type three is really more complex fistula. On the right side of the screen, 
you can see the GOES classification, which is based on the location of the fistula from the external urethral orifice also, on the size of the fistula below 1.5 centimeter and over three centimeter and in between, but also on the degree of fibrosis, which is around fistula and or the vagina. So in terms of prognosis, it can be interesting. In reality, there is a classification which is really widely used now. It is the Adapted World and Health Organization classification. It is very interesting because it classified the fistula between simple fistula with good prognosis and complex fistula with an uncertain prognosis. So what is a simple fistula with good prognosis? It is a fistula which is single, below four centimeters. It is vesicle vaginal fistula with a closing mechanisms not involved. There is no circumferential defect. The tissue loss is minimal, the ureters are not involved, and it is the first attempt to repair. By contrast, the complex fistula is fistula over four centimeter. There are multiple fistula. Sometimes there is rectal vaginal and cervical fistula. The closing mechanisms are involved. There's scarring, circumferential defect, extensive tissue loss, intravaginal ureters. There are prior failed repair and there is a context of radiation therapy. So this classification is widely used, it's quite practical, it is important. It was developed initially also for obstetric fistula, but it could be relevant for iatrogenic fistula. And classification is important in order to standardize the terminology, to do a very complete diagnosis of all lesions, to plan your repair, and also to inform the patients appropriately for uh, regarding the prognosis. So you'd make the diagnosis of the fistula, you're going to see if the ureters are involved, how the quality of tissues are for repair, you're going to classify the fistula. But now, how you are going to do in, in practice? So I'm very happy, it's very a great pleasure to invite now Professor George Kazian from Moscow, who is going to give us his tip and tricks for diagnosis and especially for cystoscopy. Please, George for me uh, to share my experience uh, about these tips and tricks for vesicle vaginal fistula repair. I have to say it's very hard to have any conflict of interest on these topics. Um, and uh, uh, here is our agenda for today. Actually, we are, uh, we have these plans. We have to speak about uh, cystoscopy and general uh, examination, which are essential part of fistula repair. And then we will speak about some special techniques for dissection, stitching. Um, it's gonna be uh, related not only to the simple fistula, which is very important, but I'll show you some cases for complex fistulas as well, how we use flaps and some other tips and tricks. So as I told you, um, Examination under anesthesia is very, very important part of fistula repair. So first of all, you have to find the fistula. And for that, you use different kinds of probes, metallic probes or bougies. So what we are looking for during examination under anesthesia, uh, we are looking for the fistula itself. Then we are looking for any kind of stitches, stones, meshes, foreign bodies, anything which could be related to your fistula, which is very important to remove everything before you start your repair. Uh, and in some cases, if you find, for example, synthetic meshes in the fistula, it's not possible to do uh, immediate repair. You have to remove all these foreign, uh, uh, foreign parts and then do uh, a delayed fistula repair. Um, you know, otherwise, your results could be compromised. In some uh, circumstances, we are thinking about tissues biopsy. Why? Because many fistulas are related to hysterectomy, and, in for, 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 in, and, and sometimes this hysterectomy 
uh, could be done for malignant cases. And uh, then you have to think about recurrence of a malignant cervical cancer or uh, uterine can cancer. So think about biopsy if you have any doubts. Then, uh, of course, you are looking for uh, tissue conditions. For example, in this case, uh, you are not uh, able to do a, a repair. Tissues are not ready. And uh, this is a matter of timing when to do this fistula repair. Uh, and now, of course, uh, we have to delay this surgery uh, because this is not the best time. You can see the fistula is not properly uh, formed. So cystoscopy is another second step of uh, fistula repair. There are some uh, tips and tricks for cystoscopy. Uh, you may use Foley catheter to obturate the vagina because if you have large fistulae during cystoscopy, you may uh, not be able to uh, fill your bladder with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, fluid. And then you just obturate uh, with a little balloon uh, the vagina. Second important point is to look for ureters. Where are ureters? And in this stage, you may use uh, indigo carmine, uh, any kind of dye to um, visualize uh, the ureters. And uh, another point is if we have to put stents or not uh, into the, into the uh, ureters. If your ureters are at the edge edges of fistula is better to put stents or ureteral catheters. Very important is to look for stitches, foreign bodies in the bladder. And another point, very important, uh, is to estimate the bladder volume. Small bladder, uh, scarred bladder, microcyst could uh, compromise uh, the results of your fistula repair. Well, uh, in some cases, we can see uh, this, um, uh, this is not typical case, actually. This is utero-vesical fistulae. You can see the cervix on the left part of the screen. And then you can see a cystoscopy. The bougie goes from cervix to a uh, uh, fundus of uterine. Uh, so this is a, a so-called uh, uter uterine fistulae, uh, vesicular uterine fistulae. So the best option in this case, of course, is to make a transvesical repair. Otherwise, you have to separate. Uh, if you go transvaginally, you have to separate completely the cervix. And uh, to make an approach, uh, typical for hysterectomy, transvaginal hysterectomy, or you have to do the hysterectomy. Uh, but when when it is a young patient. It is more, much more safer to make a um, trans uh, vesicle approach. Well, how do these dis dissections? So, for the dissections, we have several uh, tips and tricks, several techniques. First of all, I would like to uh, put your attention on uh, some uh, instruments. So, this is scalpel blade number 12. And then you have to use a very sharp scissors. Normally, we use this Jameson scissors. Uh, so on this step, uh, you do circumferential incision around the fistulae. Sometimes you can go up uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from your incision. So you do uh, another cut over there. And sometimes you, you should be actually, it's, it's quite safe to do another uh, cuts on vagina uh, vaginal skin, uh, Mercedes type uh, cuts, and then you have much more uh, space. You have to open your um, vaginal skin and uh, to reveal, to um, actually to um, visualize, completely uh, dissect the bladder. Uh, this is a typical uh, uh, case, uh, qu quite, quite big fistula you can see. Um, then uh, here is your uh, scalpel with blade number 12, very convenient uh, for these cases. And then you do this circumferential incision around the fistulae. Uh, this is quite big fistulae, uh, you can see. 
Uh, so uh, assistant uses uh, uh, um, a different kind of um, uh, vaginal uh, spatulas. Uh, you can see um, it could be brisky, retractor or other. And then uh, you can see that uh, the idea, the main, main principle is that to dissect, to, to separate the bladder wall from a vagina. And then the, here is your, you can see this uh, uh, Jameson scissors. They are very sharp, very useful. Uh, and you, then you go uh, under uh, vaginal ski, uh, trying to separate it from the bladder wall. Of course, we have to think about ureters. In this case, you see that they are, uh, there are some uh, ureteral catheters, so we are safe. Uh, so on this step, you just do the separation uh, as much as possible, because the main principles of fistula repair are uh, to create a tension-free uh, tension closure and, and watertight closure. So there are another options uh, how to do this. If you are not able really to separate this, um, uh, the, the bladder wall from, um, from the, um, the vagina, you can put this uh, Foley catheter into the fistula in order to, tra to track it, to, to, to pull it down downwards and then uh, if you are not able to do this dissection what you can do you can trim the edges of fistula or to shave the edges of fistula creating creating more space for your repair um, you can see here what we are doing we are just sh shaving removing this edges of fistula and then uh, now we have more space so this is another another option uh, another another um, a trick how to uh, have uh, this uh, tension-free uh, fistula repair. You can see here that uh, it is quite um, quite the, the mobilized bladder and then uh, now you can start stitching. Well, this is the typical uh, simple vesicovaginal fistula repair. You see that again we put a, 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 a catheter into the uh, fistulae just to track it downwards and then uh, first stages are to put uh, interrupted interrupted um, uh, stitches uh, on the edges of fistulae you see that this uh, this first two stitches are uh, quite far from the fistulae but now you can control the edges of the fistulae because this is most a tricky point if you are not controlling this uh, edges so you may have recurrence of the fistula and then another uh, stitches uh, they are always interrupted this is vitreal uh, to zero stitches uh, and now you can see that first layer is done and then you start another a second layer so two layer uh, two layer fistula closure are, are most typical um, but in some cases, when, uh, especially for aesthetic fistulae, when the patient is young, not radiated, etc., you can even go with one layer fistula repair. And of course, a third layer is vaginal skin. So uh, again, these two techniques, splitting techniques, which is more uh, traditional, more popular, and so-called excision technique, or you, sometimes we call it Lasco uh, corpor, uh, corporoclasis because uh, with excision of uh, vaginal skin, we are shortening the, the vagina uh, doing partial corporoclasis. So this is more typical for cases when uh, the fistula, fistula is not mobile, irradiated cases, scar tissues, etc. Uh, radiated fistula repair. So this uh, fistula is a complex fistula. You can see that how big it is. Uh, finger can go from vagina to the, to the bladder. Uh, ureters are not uh, visualized during cystoscopy. You cannot see this uh, ureters yet. You, then, then you can see very typical scarred um, bladder wall, uh, pale, a lot of scars and a huge fistula. You can see the balloon is uh, vaginal balloon uh, is uh, almost in the 
in the bladder. Uh, uh, so uh, during classification talk, uh, Veronique uh, told you that you have to uh, put your attention on several topics. So when you have uh, urethra, uh, so this is very good point uh, that you can uh, close this fistula and you can think and you can hope that you may have continent patient. And then why it is a complex fistula again, you can see the ureters through the vagina and you can put these catheters through the vagina. You don't need to do cystoscopy. So the edges of uh, the fistula are very close to, to uh, ureters. You can see where they are and you do not uh, need cystoscopy. Now we change uh, ureteral catheters to two stents. And again, we do this circumferential incision around the fistula, trying to separate the general skin from the bladder. Uh, sometimes we use a coterie in these cases, not very often, but again, this is possible. But the majority of cases, we do this sharp incision with, the, uh, with this special uh, scalpel. Uh, after this circumferential incision, we have to uh, think about how to mobilize the bladder. So as I told you, uh, first option is to split the bladder from the vagina. And another option is to shave a bit this vaginal skin. Uh, the main point here is how to mobilize the posterior wall of, uh, of the bladder. Um, uh, at this stage, uh, you have two options. First is to go and open uh, Douglas space uh, if uh, you feel that this is safe. So as far as you open Douglas space and you see some bowels there, it's very good, it's, it's fine, it's safe. And at this stage here, you can see uh, that um, because of scarring, we are not putting a risk and going there because we're afraid to damage some uh, bowels. But uh, what we are doing here, we are going through the detrusor, trying to mobilize the bladder. This is the second option. Go through the detrusor wall and try to mobilize your posterior bladder wall. Now you can see that this is completely uh, mobile. Uh, so we can start again from edges. Um, we use this curved, uh, curved needle, traditionally used for radical prostatectomy. Uh, again, we fix our edges uh, in order to just to orient ourselves to to have this uh, to have this uh, vision where where are the fistulae, and this um, uh, releasing cuts of uh, vagina, which I told you before, and then we start uh, interrupted uh, stitches around the fistulae, trying to uh, put all these walls together. So tension-free technique is very, very important. You have to uh, mobilize the bladder as much as possible. And then you have to think about second layer. In this particular case, second layer is very difficult to do because the bladder wall is scarred. It's not easy to do another layer on this. So what we are doing in this case? In this case, we are doing a Martzus flap because we are not able to do this second layer on the bladder. You can see that this is a lot of tension on this first uh, stitches. So uh, Matthew's flap was described by a German gynecologist in 1928. So this is a fibroadipose flap, which is harvested from the labia majora. So this is another cut skin, uh, skin cut uh, on labia majora. And this is uh, quite, uh, you always have this Marxus flap if the, even the patient is skinny. Uh, but of course you have to have uh, informed consent before you, uh, you, before your surgery, if you are thinking about uh, Marxus flap, because sometimes you have quite a lot of morbidity on this. Now we harvested the Marxus flap. Uh, you can see this. And this Marxus flap goes not uh, trans uh, on transobturator way, like uh, how we do t t these TVTs or whatever. It goes uh, subcutaneously. You, 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 you put it under the skin uh, with uh, any kind of uh, instrument 
uh, you can see that uh, it is quite uh, quite a good one, the long one. And then we use this as a second layer uh, to create a water type water type uh, closure. And now, uh, as far as we do this, we fix it normally. We fix it to this uh, fistula area area in order to prevent uh, migration of this Marsus flap. And then we start um, uh, 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 the closure of vaginal wall. So this is normally uh, again interrupted stitches with vicryl, uh, nothing special. And now with, you see that we're trying to avoid any uh, space, any dead space uh, on this area. So this is for complex fistulae, for radiated fistulae, for example, or large, large fistulae. Uh, and uh, sometimes we, we use Martius flap for um, urethra vaginal fistula, which is not a topic for our talk today. But again, we do this, why? Because we need a space for uh, further anti-incontinence surgery. Well, uh, and the final step is to close this uh, skin incision on labia majora. Uh, what else, what kind of other flaps we may use in these situations? So this is another radiated fistulae. You see that there is a lot of tension, but again, we are mobilizing the bladder. But what we are seeing here, we, we see here that we don't have enough vaginal skin to closure. So we harvest a skin flap or so-called uh, gluteal flap. Uh, so this gluteal flap comes with skin and this skin uh, covers the vagina, and uh, then uh, we can uh, we can uh, do a, 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 a fistula repair uh, when we don't have enough vaginal skin, when uh, especially for irradiated cases. So again, this is complex complex cases. Well, um, I hope that we have uh, some questions. That's why. Uh, I'll just summarize and then we'll co go back to some uh, st stages of uh, fistula repair. So what, uh, what I have to say that uh, examination under general anesthesia and cystoscopy are a very important part of fistula repair. It's an essential part of fistula repair. So what we are looking for during uh, examination, we are looking for ureters, we are looking for foreign bodies, stones, stitches, we think about uh, biopsy if needed. Um, then uh, normally what you can do, you can put a Foley catheter into the fistula to uh, pull it down and uh, to have it in your hands. And then uh, you do this circumferential incision around the fistula with, uh, with the scalpel. And uh, do you, then you have this uh, option to split the bladder from vagina or to uh, trim it if uh, splitting is, uh, is not possible because of scars. So when you start your fistula repair, you have to start, start from, from uh, edges, from this uh, normally lateral edges. Uh, you have it in your hands. You uh, know that uh, you don't forget uh, anything else. You are on the safe side. And then you go uh, with interrupted stitches between these two, uh, two uh, ligatures. Uh, normal, uh, normally, this is two layer uh, closure. Uh, it should be tension free in a matter of uh, bladder. So the bladder should be uh, mobilized as much as possible. And then it should be watertight. You may choose, uh, you may uh, actually, uh, check uh, if you did uh, watertight closure or not, filling the bladder uh, through the catheter. Or, but normally, uh, we are not putting the catheter during the fistula repair, then you have some urine in the bladder, then you can see. But you may put some dye, some, uh, some, uh, some water into the bladder uh, and to check if you are uh, watertight or not. And then final step is the general closure. So uh, what about flaps? Flaps are for radiated uh, fistulae and for large fistulae, of course, because uh, flap harvesting sometimes uh, gives um, additional morbidity. 
So um, this is uh, my final slide. Um, I think that we have some questions I can see. And uh, Tufan, if you may uh, just go through questions, uh, then we may answer this all together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George, for this uh, great talk. Thank you, Veronique, for your great talk, too. Oh, uh, George, uh, my sincere congratulations to you, because I know how difficult it is to take these video captures during uh, such a uh, complicated surgery. Uh, so uh, really, uh, this was very informative. So there are questions, and questions uh, are uh, actually uh, not unexpected. The first question uh, is coming from Dr. Tanvir Ahmed. He is asking about the uh, timing of the repair, optimal timing of repair. And we know there is no single correct answer for that. And the answer for that may vary from physician to physician and also from the type and etiology of fistula to another one. So uh, how would you answer uh, briefly this question? Uh, Veronique, would you like to uh, comment on that? Yes. So it is very difficult to answer about the optimal time for surgery because there are two uh, situations. Sometimes you know exactly when the fistula occurs, for example, after a removal of a mesh. But most of the time you don't know when it occurs. So patients are just brought to your uh, clinics like that and you don't know exactly what happened uh, in the past. Uh, I, I can say that according to the literature, there are no difference in success rates for early. I think early we can consider it within three weeks after uh, occurrence of uh, uh, the, the fistula or delayed, delayed is after three months. Uh, so no difference in success rates for early or delayed closure of a vesicovaginal fistula. There is no solid uh, data to uh, recommend early or late repair. That's the literature mm -hmm. review. Just uh, following your comment, then I think I may ask George, then I think this is a physician dependent decision. Are there certain points where you choose an early delay are there certain uh, patient characteristics where you would like to go to a delayed repair? Thank you. Thank you, Tufan. Actually, uh, you may answer these questions on uh, two ways. Uh, first, we may say how many days or, or months you should wait, whatever, or uh, if the fistula is ready to be repaired. So um, I would say in our case, we are not big fan of early repair. Uh, typical fistula repair for simple fistula, I would say, after coming from benign hysterectomy, for example, we do more or less after two months from the first leak, month and a half, two months. And for radiation fistula, uh, from, not from radiation, but from the day uh, of leak, we wait mm -hmm. four, six months. This is our practice, I mean, I mean, based on our experience. Uh, but I would say that this is not about days or months. Uh, there are three points. First, tissues. Are the tissues ready uh, to be repaired? So the fistula should be somehow matured or formed. You should have no necrosis, you should have no inflammation or minimal inflammation, uh, no stones, no stitches, no mm, uh, foreign bodies. So. If you have mesh, you have to remove and come back. Uh, and then uh, second point is uh, if the patient is ready. So more you wait, uh, better results you have, but patients, they are suffering. So they are not really you know, uh, ready to wait uh, being completely wet. Mm -hmm. And third point is uh, if the doctor is ready to make this repair. If, so they are, they are through three points. So tissues should be ready, the patient should be ready, and the uh, medical staff should be ready. Because uh, for complex fistula, sometimes you ask your gynecological colleagues or, or proctologists or whatever. And so uh, this is very, very important point. So it's not about days or months or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I actually agree with both of you. Uh, there are no RCTs actually to answer this question. And uh, basically the evidence is based on expert opinion or a small case uh, series. Um, in, in my practice, actually, if, when I see an obstetric fistula, uh, I wait at least three months, maybe more, up to six months, depending on the tissue quality. Uh, but when I'm planning a vaginal uh, fistula repair after hysterectomy, for example, uh, I think the waiting periods are becoming uh, less and I can consider surgery if the, as you said, if the quality of the tissue is good, even uh, after two or three weeks. Uh, just following this uh, discussion, may, may I ask you about your experience on conservative management of fistula? Veronique said it's important to know uh, the start point of the fistula. Sometimes we see that and we see in uh, very early uh, after the occurrence of fistula, the patient. Uh, how, do you perform conservative management? How do you do that? And uh, are you happy with that? What are your success rates? Or are there any, again, certain patient-related uh, figures that may, um, that may actually tell us uh, about the uh, chance of uh, success? George, can I start with you now to answer this and then with Veronique? Yes, of course. Uh, actually, we don't see a lot of uh, patients um, uh, who are fit for this conservative repair, probably because uh, we have a bit different practice. This is uh, expert clinic or whatever. They are, we see a lot, 40% of our patients, they have they are secondary cases. So they, they are coming for fistula uh, recurrence. So this is different practice. We don't see a lot of primary cases. Normally other guys are doing this and we have quite a lot of experience with fistula repair, but I remember only a few cases when we put the catheter, we send them home and they are coming back uh, and they say they're fine. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes this are, th these cases are related to combined fistula, ureteral, uh, vaginal and uh, vaginal small fistula. When you put the stand, and then you put a catheter with stand, you send them home, they come, somehow this, you know, a little fistula repairs, and then you say, okay, a miracle happened. Uh, there is no fistula, but this is quite rare in our practice. But of course, you can, if you see small fistula, you may try, you may try nothing, no, no problem with it at all. To put mm -hmm. the catheter for, for several weeks and uh, to wait. Um, when the fistula is formed, you have uh, mucosa around the fistula, fistula tract. It's impossible to close, it will never, repair. When it is fresh and no mucosa on fistula tract, yeah, possible. Or you should do fulguration, whatever. But again, this is a surgery. If you do fulguration, you do, uh, for small fistula, it's much easier to do a simple fistula repair, which is very, very uh, fine procedure. It's not, it's not a major procedure uh, that I showed you. Um, I don't see any reason uh, to put um, a catheter and make a fulguration. If you do fulguration, you do anesthesia, you do fistula repair. But for small, fresh fistulas, yes, because it could, could work. Thank you very much. And George. for glues, all the things, you know, I don't, I, we don't There do are this, questions you know. about it yet, too. Yeah. So are you using any glues or anything? No, no, like no, 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 no. no. <laughs> no. So, Veronique, uh, what would be your answer to that question, please? Yes, the conservative management includes uh, several. Things. So uh, we do, do we have to keep in mind that uh, there is a nutritional support, which is important, stop uh, tobacco, in, uh, tobacco uh, intoxic yeah. intoxication, sometimes antimicrobial therapy in case of infections with symptoms, and also take care of the skin in case of uh, wearing pads and, and important uh, numbers of pads. So this really uh, belongs to the conservative management. Now, uh, regarding uh, spontaneous closure, so I can give you some figures because we just uh, review it uh, with, the, with the EEGU group. So the spontaneous closure is about 13%, but really for very small fistula with size, as you said, George, uh, below one centimeter, 
and you, you have to manage with your recapitalization in parallel. Mm -hmm. And there are some options with pharmacotherapies, so some authors for a small fistula, and it's less below seven millimeters, so very small, and frequently after C-section. Uh, they use uh, estrogen or sometimes combination of estrogen and progesterone to induce uh, amenorrhea. And uh, some authors report this. Well, uh, the results are very uh, variable. Uh, there are no RCT, of course, for that. But it is really for very small fistula and I think not really symptomatic. Uh, so you, you can wait with this. Yeah, uh, thank you once again. Uh, there are, as you said, uh, studies. Actually, this is related uh, directly to the size and the, uh, the time of the diagnosis uh, of the future. Once the tract is epitalized, then uh, you don't have much chance uh, for a spontaneous healing. There are studies showing that uh, size less than three meters, when it's fulgurated, fulguration can also be an option, but also uh, I don't have uh, much experience with that, just my uh, practice is also very much in parallel uh, to George's uh, experience. So I would like to be a little bit more quick with the questions because there are lots of questions, um, difficult questions. Uh, when, you con when will you consider to make a, a urinary diversion and give up with the treatment uh, of uh, fistula, George? That's well, this is a very good question. Actually, it depends on bladder volume. So if you can see that the bladder volume is small and you, 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 you are not, uh, even if you close this fistula, these ladies will be completely uh, wet because of incontinence uh, or they will have a horrible uh, frequency, whatever. So no reason to make a fistula repair. We are speaking about radiation fistula, right? Major fistulas. Uh, if your bladder volume is compromised, significantly compromised, but if your bladder volume is uh, quite enough, you may try. You may try because of course the quality of life of a patient with uh, um, diversion is different. Even in the best clinics, it's different life, okay? Um, you may try to, to close the fistula if you have, if you have um, enough bladder remaining. This is the main, the main point. Exactly. Um, so we, this is our criteria, if we do it or not. Um, uh, thank you, George. Uh, there is another question about the flaps, but you have already answered that very well, showed that very well in your presentation. This was an early question before your presentation. Uh, Veronique, there is a question. Uh, is there any use for infiltration with adrenaline uh, during surgery when you make the incision? I think that's the question. And uh, also, can we use tacosil instead of Martius flap? There is another question. Um. Uh, yes, for adrenaline uh, infiltration, why not? Sometimes we mm -hmm. use it. It depends on I think, the quality of the tissue once again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have no experience at all with Tacozil. Tacozil, it was uh, initially designed for uh, bleeding. So uh, not for like a bulking agents or not uh, for uh, yeah. replacing tissue. So uh, I do know, I never use that. I don't know if okay. George has a different experience. Well, um, for, for hydrodistension, uh, we don't do it normally because sometimes you may use your, you may lose just your layers, your, your you know, tissues, uh, we always do hydrodistension, uh, hydrodissection, sorry, hydrodissection with the normal saline or normal saline plus some epinephrine when we do a prolapse or incontinence, whatever. But normally we don't do it for fistulae because you lose your vision, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, as for, well, maybe you may, uh, as for uh, taco seal, no, we don't, we don't, because it's not watertight. Um, yeah. it, it, it will just, you know, when you put it and you have bleeding, you don't, for, during prostate, for example, you have a lot of bleeding. 
you should try it first and put it and try to avoid this bleeding because then it will become a kind of thing, you know, kind of a mess. Uh, no, we, we, we probably, but we don't have an experience with this. Uh, thank you. I have nothing, nothing to add to your comments. Just I mean, to may I just, just you know what sure what, uh, when we put uh, what what is why we put this uh, flaps right for Marcus flap Marcus flap gives not only uh, this you know fat tissue there but it gives some blood supply we believe on this that when when we have scar tissues we bring some some you know uh, blood supply over there but for tacosil you just make a yeah. you know it's, it's different okay. different action you don't have blood supply. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't perform hydrodissection either, uh, and I agree with you that it changes the uh, tissue quality when you do that. I wouldn't do that. And uh, also, just let me, uh, I don't have any experience with tacosil either. I don't use that. Um, uh, George, there's a question to you. You said quite a lot of morbidity after Martius flap. Uh, actually, I didn't catch that in your presentation, but which are they? Well, it's not a lot of morbidity, but it's not nothing like a minor procedure. The patient should know that you're going to yeah. do a cut over there. It's a major cut. It's not small. Well, and sometimes you, they may have numbness. They may have pain, the infected wound, whatever. It happens, especially when you just start this technique. You should be a bit far from the skin when you harvest the, the flap. If you are close to the skin, you may have skin necrosis over the labia majora, etc. So it's a, it's a very, very good flap. But again, it's nothing that you do another stitch or whatever. This is another cut in a different area, uh, quite far from your uh, surgery. So you should have, uh, you should warn the patient that of course, nice, it will be a fine cut, no problem. If you don't mind, we harvest over there. But uh, my point is that, in, well, plan it in, in, in advance. Uh, don't do it spontaneously. Just warn your patient that you will have additional cut. Same for Schuchardt cut. Schuchardt cut is a cut or it's a peritoneotomy. You, you do this to, to have an access to uh, uh, fistulae. Uh, this is lateral cut, like, you know, you cut the peritoneum. Uh, perineum uh, uh, to uh, perineum to uh, uh, laterally down, downward and then of course you have to warn your patient yes you may have some additional uh, skin cuts this is my point I think I, informed consent should be taken before any procedure uh, like that Veronique yes I've got just a question for George regarding flaps because uh, so we all agree that you have to plan it before doing it. Um, does it mean that you don't do it for the first uh, attempt of repair uh, because you have to inform and to uh, and you cannot plan sometimes in advance? Or but we know also that the first attempt uh, repair is the most important. If you can do it once you'd better do it just once and not do redo surgery. So I think that the, 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 the good timing for, blacks, for flaps are sometimes difficult to plan. Do you so, do it for, for the first uh, attempt? Uh, well, um, it's a very important question. Um, actually, if we are doing a fistula repair for simple fistula, so-called, right? The WHO classification, simple fistula, Normally we don't do Marcus flap. You don't need to do this. It's okay, it's simple fistula. They are uh, recovering very nicely. But if this is complex fistula, we almost always do this Marcus flap, or at least we plan it. We plan it, depends on uh, how um, easy you can do a second layer, or uh, how, how, uh, how easy you do this mobilization of bladder, uh, or if you need additional tissue over there, uh, so uh, this depends on type of fistula. Fistulas are very difficult to standardize and uh, that's why I like more this WHO classification because this is, uh, you have some prognosis on this. It's not only about centimeters or, you know, millimeters or whatever. Um, it's, it's more, well, it's more 
um, I would say simplified, but at the same time you have prognosis. Okay, so there are so many questions. Um, there are many questions about how you choose between uh, transvaginal and transabdominal route. And also when you choose transabdominal route, there are different techniques and there are also questions about how you uh, choose further between different uh, transabdominal uh, routes. Uh, Veronique, would you answer that uh, as brief as possible? I know that it's a very long question, but... Yes, so to be brief, yeah. one, one way to answer is depends on the location of the fistula. If you've got a very high uh, loca location and fixed in the vault, uh, you're not going to mobilize and you're not going, you're, you cannot do it uh, with a transvaginal way. So it would be inaccessible if this, this is a high fistula and fixed in the vault. Now, if you do an abdominal procedure, um, if you make a transvesical approach, it has the advantage to be extra peritoneal. So it has advantage to be uh, like this. But uh, if you do a transperitoneal repair, well, it's used less, but is used, I mean, less often now, but now uh, there is a growing interest for laparoscopic repair for robotic assisted repair. So uh, the transperitoneal approach uh, now is, uh, is, um, is of interest now. Sometimes we use combined transperitoneal and transvesical procedure uh, for fistula repair, especially uh, after C-section. Now, if you want a uh, very strict scientific data. Of course, there are no uh, high uh, um, level data comparing abdominal mm. or vaginal approach regarding success rates uh, and comparing this different approach. So it depends really on what, which fistula you have, the location, and then, uh, and, but I think it's very important to masterize all these approaches. Exactly, exactly. You have to, uh, Yes. Yeah, go ahead. No, you have ready to know all the procedures because sometimes you cannot, uh, you just discover yeah. uh, the difficulty per, uh, intraoperatively. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, for the comfort of the patient, uh, I uh, tend to choose always the vaginal approach as uh, much as uh, possible. Of course, if there's a need, for example, for ureteric reimplantation, of course, there's, this is something that will lead you to abdominal approaches. But many, many uh, vesicovaginal fistula cases can uh, actually successfully, successfully uh, treat it with a uh, vaginal approach. Uh, George, I would like to ask you two questions if you do not have any other burning thing to answer the previous question. Uh, the question is, um, how, when do you allow your patients to uh, have sexual intercourse after vesicovaginal vagina repair? And the other question is, um, how long do you drain the bladder and how after the surgery? Well, again, depends on the type of fistula. If we are, thinking, we are talking about simple fistula, uh, so this is uh, from 10 to 12 days for uh, ureteral for ureteral catheter, and for sexual intercourse, uh, this is uh, after one month, four weeks, five weeks, we say, as far uh, as uh, stitches are, uh, they 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 gone. Uh, so. Uh, uh, for complex cases, we drain it a bit more. We put, uh, we keep stents a bit more. Uh, we keep stents, if we stand it for complex cases, as I showed you, we keep them for five weeks. And uh, for catheter, we keep at least, at least uh, two weeks or a bit more, depends on how it goes. But again, actually, if you have recurrence after complex cases, you have it within 10 days, 12 days. So more or less, if you have recurrence, you don't have to keep it it will just okay. recover, you just remove it. Mm -hmm. Veronique, do you agree with George regarding the answer? If yes? Yes. Okay, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, there are many questions about the uh, following case that I'm going to describe. If the patient has sphincteric injury and stress urinary incontinence, do you 
uh, combine your anti-incontinence management together with the repair of the vesicovaginal fistula? If yes, what is your preferred technique? No, I never do that. I think we should uh, separate uh, the surgery. Mm -hmm. And if decided to do, for, uh, for I don't know for which reason, but uh, synthetic meshes or materials, devices are really not recommended. Mm -hmm. George, may I take your comment also on this question, please? For incontinence? Yes, sir. Well, um, again, it's very tricky to put a sling after uh, fistula repair. Well, I mean, it depends on if it is vesicovaginal fistulae and urethra is in touch, yeah, you can do. But if this is urethrovaginal fistulae, I think we are talking about urethrovaginal fistulae, right? So for urethrovaginal yeah. fistulae... Or, or fistula, uh, which is which also associated with sphincteric incontinence. Depends, you know, if it is on the bladder neck, is different. Your urethra is still there. You put your mid mm -hmm. link on the urethra. So if you are far from your scar, well, you can, but you should wait three months, four months to, to be sure that everything, if you far, if you're, you're, you should do it on the area of fistula, well, not. You should go okay. for, for a fascial sling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Certainly these are very complicated cases. Another complicated case may be the ones uh, after irradiation of the bladder who have bladder non-compliance, very small bladder capacities. Mm -hmm. uh, if, do you perform bladder augmentation uh, combined with the uh, fistula treatment in these patients or any other Normally, method? we go for diversion, normally. Mm -hmm. we, what kind of diversion? Well, it depends. Depends, but normally in our cases, it's majority cases, bricker. So mm -hmm. simple. Mm -hmm. Veronique, do you have uh, any answer to that case? Any yes. miracle solution? No, it happens uh, that we make uh, augmentation cystoplasty, but a small one just to, uh, to um, I mm -hmm. mean, if you really, the defects is really, uh, and the fistula is really large, it just to, uh, to in order to close the bladder properly, um, but it's really tricky if you want to make uh, an, uh, an augmentation cystoplasty in the context of radiation because sometimes also the, your small bowel is is not good also. So uh, often we do a ileal conduit. Mm -hmm. And my last question to both of you: Do you excise the fistula tract or do you leave it as it is? when you operate? Uh, <laughs> well, sometimes you uh, try to remove this, you know, epithelized uh, tissues, but in, in, in big fistula, you, you, have, you don't like to make it even bigger. So we don't normally, we don't normally go for this. Um, if you do a splitting technique, you don't have to, you just invert this mucosa into the bladder. But, uh, well, in some cases, if you go for LASCO technique, you do a partial colpoclasis, well, you, you, you may, you can trim a bit edges of fistula because you are not, you are scarred bladder, you're not able to invert this tissue. So this is the point. Okay, Veronique? Yes, totally agree. And I mean, you can pinch with forceps this is this area which is not yes. really uh, good during yeah. the surgery until the end so we we it's left it we leave yes. it yeah. yes. <laughs> well we so, have lots of questions huh? yeah lots of questions but i there are multiple same questions yes. repeating yes. Uh, questions i so, saw a question about cy cy cystostomy don't do cystostomy you, for female patients you can use a catheter so. yeah okay. so, short answer Mm -hmm. Well, many questions. Okay. So, but I think uh, we are already uh, over our time. And so we have, I think, come to the end of the webinar. And uh, I would like to give the last words to you, George and Veronique. Do you have any take home messages? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tofan. Uh, you know what? Um, uh, when you say fistula, you think about you know, Africa and, you know, Asia and things like this. 
but we still have fistulae in, in, in uh, North America, Europe, uh, Russia, whatever. Uh, but this is different fistulae. So the problem is why we do not have a solid data. The problem is that all majority of uh, studies, they are based on obstetric fistulas coming from Africa, which are not really the same type of uh, problem when we see, which we see here. Um, so you, it's not easy to put this experience on uh, gynecological fistula or surgical fistula. So you should think about this. And second point is that unfortunately, uh, still, even uh, we have, we know that how much efforts the WHO put on this, you know, teaching fistula surgeons, etc. Still, uh, not everyone is doing fistula repair, only some groups are doing fistula repair in Africa, for example. And still, uh, we have this problem in uh, Europe as well. Why? Because this is rare cases, rare cases, probably. But I'm, I'm quite aware that majority of fistulas, simple fistulas could be done uh, for any trained uh, urologist. It's not necessary to send them to a reference center. So you can do it. Yeah, so it's important to collect data, maybe in registries, as you have pioneered. Um, I think that's very important. Uh, yeah, Veronique, last words, please. Uh, yes, two words. So first of all, the first uh, surgery is the most important. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, yes, I would be very happy if we could set up a uh, training for urologists to do that in our countries, because as you said, is not as uh, infrequent and we have to make it available to everybody and not only expert, very trained centers. So this is my last uh, words. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think it's time to close our webinar. It was really a great pleasure for me uh, to be with you, Professor Veronique Fay and Professor Georg Kassian. Uh, I think it, this has been a fruitful webinar, and I will also thank uh, our attendees for all their questions and comments. And also, once, once again, thanks a lot. Many thanks to the European School of uh, Urology and uh, all the uh, office staff helping us with this uh, webinar. So I wish uh, everybody a safe, uh, healthy stay uh, at their homes. And once again, thank you so much uh, uh, for this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.